The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzlingly white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. When the cloud came, then the cloud came, casting a shadow over them, from the cloud came a voice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. Obvious today celebrates the feast of the Transfiguration of the Lord. As you undoubtedly would recall, always on the second Sunday of Lent, in all three of the Uh, uh, lectionary cycles, we similarly celebrate the feast. I don't know that it's called a feast at that time, but it's placed there because of its purpose in the immediacy of the Lord's Passover, his Paschal mystery, dying and rising to new life. This particular feast comes from as early as the 5th century in the Eastern Church and has subsequently for many generations celebrated in the West as well. The fundamental movement, of course, is really ultimately, on the one hand, the glory of God. And as much as we might fear or obviously resist, it really is about our glory as well. The first reading really is about God's glory. It'd be interesting, but not really all that critically important, if people could tell stories or have experiences like Daniel has had in this Old Testament period. I'm quite certain these kinds of things happen today, but God knows they'd never make the paper, and if they did, they'd be scorned and and, and criticized anyways. But uh, Daniel, like Ezekiel and so many others, have these visions. You would recall, for instance, St. Teresa of Avila, who would levitate from time to time, and she would just say to the Lord, Oh, stop it, put me down. She didn't want to make a big deal about it. This is a little different. Why is it that Jesus is so glorified? We know the answers, but it's important that we are reminded. We all have a legacy in life. We all have um, historical emotional memories. Usually, we tend to get picked or remember the negative ones probably a little more than the positive ones. But fortunately, by the light of grace, we recall the positive memories of family and dinners and and marriages, firstborn child, that kind of thing. But generally, we are weighed down by the emotional memory pictures that were negative. Abuse, neglect, abandoning, you know, poor parenting, you know, dysfunctional families. I mean, who lives in the perfect home? And yet even in the perfection of life, at the same time, there's always going to be tension. It strikes me that, again, the first reading is making it clear, it's hard to grasp, but the lordship, the sovereignty of God in Jesus, the human divine one. Jesus is that Son of Man, 
coming on the clouds, the clouds of heaven. It's Jesus who comes before the Ancient One, more commonly known to us as the Father, and that he, re he receives dominion, glory, and kingship. I know they're just words. They're not the kind of words that we use today for our leaders. We don't have kings. You know, we have a president, etc. But that lordship of Jesus, we belong to God. We have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Our lives ultimately are not our own. It seems to me that that theme picks up in this second reading. And pertinently, uh, written by St. Peter himself, who experienced these things, both the highest and the lowest of his own human experience. So that Peter, on the one hand, literally, pun intended, he's on the highest mountain, seeing the vision of the glorified Lord. And within what then? A month, a couple of weeks, he's in the darkness of darkness, so that he betrays the Lord. I do not know the man. So then we have his words, and they're important words, particularly today, in this age of relativism. Truth is only relative to me, my truth. Well, that's your truth. Many people today, I don't believe those old stories. I don't believe those old things about God and Christ, those myths. So Peter poignantly says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made these mysteries known to you, but by the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were eyewitnesses. So how is it that Jesus reveals his glory? Again, because he has no negative legacy. There's no legacy of sin. There's no negative emotional memory pictures in the light or the life of Jesus. Now again, there's a tension there, isn't there? because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. His legacy is the Father's love <clears throat> that he perfectly knew from before time, because for God there is no time. But then God in Christ comes into time. And then we know, obviously, that remaining in the purity of love, divine love, becoming fully human, Jesus experienced, quite literally, many of the things that we experience, rejection, abandonment, humiliation, shame, guilt was cast upon him that was not his to carry, physical uh, abuse, probably sexual abuse, and that overnight between his arrest and, and going to the cross, all those things. But in the purity of the divine love, Father, not my will, your will be done. That's the legacy, if we can use that word. It's not a big enough word, is it, for the life of Jesus because he's God. Legacy implies a time frame. But the legacy of God is eternal. But the love of in Jesus is also eternal. It's divine. So that he can hold intention the humiliation and shame and physical, mental, or emotional abuse that he bore for our sake because we bear these things. So that the glory of Jesus ultimately is the reflection of the divine life through his physical body so that the disciples, Peter, James, and John, could see the light of the Father's love, the light of the Father's glory, the Father's purity in the person of Christ. Historically, or um, the word classically, the gospel really is for hope. So that when Jesus comes to the cross and they come to those darkest hours, they can remember the light of his glory. As the gospel concluded, they kept the matter to themselves, but they kept wondering and questioning what rising from the dead meant. It's curious that seemingly we are a much less religious culture. People say, well, I don't, I don't follow religion, but I'm spiritual. Yes, you are. But at the same time, there's increasing stories about people who hear from their loved ones who have died. They have visions, they hear voices, and they get words that, you know, their loved one, their mother or their child, whoever, you know, that person they realize is in light and peace. Well, that's the Lord. 
God gives evidence of his own reality. As we celebrate then this feast of the transfiguration of the Lord, again, Jesus is glorified. But the other side of that is, notice, in their human frailty and the weight of sin, which every human being feels, Peter, James, and John fall to the ground out of fear. Terrified is the word. So terrified were they, they hardly knew what to say. Jesus was clearly, deeply distressed by the fear of the cross. Father, if this cup can pass, let it pass. But love triumphed, not my will, your will be done. Ultimately, as for Jesus, so for us. This is my beloved one. Listen to him. We are the beloved ones. Again, as we pray today, let God be praised. You are a beloved of the Lord. And however terrible you think your sins are, God's love and God's mercy and God's salvation is greater. Can we deny our sin? Absolutely not. But nor should we eclipse the surpassing power of the divine in Jesus who died and who is now alive. As Jesus shares the Father's glory, so are we to share the Father's love as his beloved brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of our God. Praise be God in Jesus Christ.